uh, then we'll, uh, we'll read that. So I want to talk to you from the title of I Want to Be Where You Are from Psalm 84. Henry Ward Beecher was, um, was a great pastor from a different era, from yesteryear. Uh, many would come all around to hear uh, Henry Beecher uh, preach. He was very popular. Many people in, enjoyed him. And he had to be absent from the pulpit one Sunday. And so he asked his brother, Thomas Beecher, to fill in. And when, he, when many of the folks saw that the famous Henry Beecher Ward was, uh, Ward Beecher was not going to be there uh, that Sunday when they show up and he wasn't there, then um, all of a sudden they... For those of you not in the room, we uh, have the scriptures reading somewhere, and we're waiting for that to get turned off here. Okay, there we go. Those, those, little, uh, those little paws are, are funny. I, so so when, when Henry Ward Beecher was not going to be able to be, able to be there, his brother, uh, he asked his brother to preach in his place. When the people showed up, they began to groan that, uh, that Henry Beecher wasn't there. And many of them got up to leave. And, uh, and his brother Thomas simply said to those who were leaving, he said this, to those of you who came to worship Henry Ward Beecher, please leave. But those who came to worship God, please be seated. <laughs> it reminds us of, of why we come to church, ultimately. Yes, we come for fellowship, we come to, to strengthen one another, we come to hear stories with one another and do life together, but ultimately none of that matters if our focus isn't, isn't the Lord. Regardless of who would communicate the truth and regardless of who would sing the songs or play the instrument, ultimately it's not about those who are assisting us in worship, it's about the one, the one that we worship and I think this psalm really brings that out very well. I want to be where you are. Um, you can remind, remain seated, just honor the, the reading of the, of the Holy Scriptures. I'm going to read the whole psalm. It's 12 verses. It says this, To the choir master, according to the Giddeth, which many believed was like an eight-stringed guitar of some sorts. It had originally had its, um, its uh, origins, I think, within Philistine uh, culture, a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield, and the Lord bestows favor and honor. No good things does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would bless the reading of your word, the studying of your word, and the transformation that your word partnered with your spirit can have and will have in our lives this evening. I ask that you would help us not to just engage our minds with truth, but you would help us all to engage our hearts with truth. Would you speak something through me that is going to be an encouragement, maybe conviction, something that's going to strengthen and teach and help us in our faith. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So this particular psalm was written, it tells us, by one of the sons of Korah. Uh, The sons of Korah were temple singers who were responsible for corporate corporate worship. Some commentaries, commentators, believe that the sons of Korah was a whole family that was set aside to uh, to lead uh, to lead worship uh, in temple temple Jerusalem. So that's who it was written by. <clears throat> There's a considerable question as to the location of the psalmist and his motivation in composing this particular psalm. Uh, first of all, it seems as if he is far away and longing to get back. Many, if you'd study this passage, many would use titles that would talk about um, a, a pilgrimage, that this is, this is some sort of a, a pilgrimage psalm that is to be sung by those who live on the outskirts of uh, Jerusalem and other cities. And when, when they would come, they would use this as a song to sing. We do know from Deuteronomy 16, 16, that uh, all good Jews were to uh, leave where they lived and trek to Jerusalem three times, three times a year. And there were three festivals, three feasts, three times that they were to come. And so uh, this, many believe this is a pilgrimage psalm that could have been written for the very purpose, or at least they used it for the purpose of singing and worshiping along the way uh, to Zion. But it seems as if, uh, it's also a, a psalm of blessing, it's also a psalm of, uh, of joy. It's also a psalm of trusting because the word blessed is used at least three times. But uh, it seems as if the psalmist is far away and longing to get back. You, just, you hear that language. Um, he's, he's wanting to be uh, uh, in the courts of the Lord. His Heart and flesh sing for joy. He's lo- his soul longs. Uh, he's even jealous, as we'll talk about, about birds who can nest right there in the temple. And he'd rather be a, uh, someone who guarded the gates of the temple than to be someone who, who lived lavishly in a city of wickedness. So there is a longing to be back. Is, this, is the psalmist in, in captivity in Babylon? Is that, uh, is that who this is? Is his home far away? It seems like it possibly could be, verse 5, blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. Like you have to travel to get there. Um, is it that he cannot corporately worship God with others in the temple but longs to? We, we simply don't know. Or the other option is he's right there. He just can't get enough. Is the psalmist right there at the temple doing his job, enjoying corporate worship, but just can't get enough and yearns for more? Does he just not want the experience to ever end? I simply don't know, and there's not enough information. It seems as if he's probably away by some of the language of the roads to Zion and his desire to long for the courts of the Lord, and, uh, but we really don't know. Regardless of whatever case it is, if he's far away and longing to get back, or if he's right there, he just can't get enough. And I have totally experienced that. I remember I, I grew up in the church, uh, but uh, uh, but Christ was not real to me. I was living in the I was I was riding along in the faith of my parents, and things were just not good. Not in my life, not in our family's life. Uh, things were not good. I grew up in the church. I knew all the right answers. But my heart was far from the Lord. And that's a whole, and I've shared that testimony in bits and pieces, and I won't do that again today. But I can remember at uh, 15 years of age, just weeks or a month or two away from my 16th birthday, I can still remember how God pressed in, pressed in deeply. And back then, because I have good theology, I know you can't lose your salvation, I just assumed it was a, it was, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, a rededication. Now looking back, I totally believe that that was when, when I got saved. But I can just remember just being awakened and alivened to the things of God. 
And I remember I would, I just, I would cut the grass, I would clean the church, I would do anything to be, you know, in my 15-year-old brain, where God was. You know, I just want to be where God was. You know, give me something to clean, give me something to do, I'll do anything. I just want to be here at the church, I want to be where God is. Of course, that's bad theology, but you gotta understand a 15-year-old kid who, who uh, was far away from the Lord. So I, I get that second one. Regardless, there is, uh, regardless if he's far away and wants to get back, or if he's right there and he can't get enough, regardless of it, there is a deep yearning for God. It's all over this psalm as we read it. There is a deep, deep yearning for God. And the true object of his longing, let me say this, and I'll say this several more times, because this is a huge, matter of fact, this will be a bullet statement. You could write this down. There's gonna be an opportunity to hear this a few more times. The true object of his longing isn't the temple, but God himself. I mean, you could get, you can make that mistake very easily because he says things like, my soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. And I'd rather, I'd, uh, I'd rather um, for one day be in your courts uh, than to be, it's than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. So it'd be easy for you to make that mistake. But the only reason he wants to be in the temple is because the temple is where the, the, the visible physical presence of God, like a token presence of God, a Shekinah glory presence of God is. For, for the Jew, God inhabits all things, but his special presence dwells in the temple. And in fact, did dwell in... Um, in the temple, and so the true object of his longing, don't make this mistake, isn't the temple really, it's God himself. When I was reading this, there were really two songs that came to mind. Uh, first of all, who couldn't think of um, Better's One Day by Matt Redman. I mean, for basically, Matt Redman's uh, Better's One Day is just yanked right off the page. <laughs> so... Uh, so that just seemed like the obvious song. But the one that really hit me the most as I was thinking about it, and I do this all the time, I think of, I'll read a passage and a, a song will come to mind, is a song by Don Moen back in the early 90s, maybe late 80s, I can't remember, called I Want to Be Where You Are. And, I, and he was creating, he was trying to write a musical, a Christian musical about um, uh, kind of with a theme of, uh, of the tabernacle. And um, he just, uh, he just, he eventually scra scrapped the idea, but out of it, out of that work came a song that was supposed to be in the musical that didn't happen. And the lyrics are this, I just want to be where you are dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar, draw me near to where you are. I just want to be where you are dwelling in your presence forever. Take me to the place where you are because I just want to be with you. I just want to be where you are, dwelling in your presence, feasting at your table and surrounded by your glory. In your presence, that's where I always want to be. I just want to be, I just want to be with you. I just want to be where you are, dwelling in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near to where you are. Oh my God, you are my strength and my song. And when I'm in your presence, though I'm weak, you're always strong. And then I just want to be where you are. But that was the song that was kept playing in my mind as I, as I listened to this. Because the very, if I was to give a point, I'm going to give a point for the first four verses, and I'm going to yank verse 10. So verses 1 through 4 and verse 10 are my first point. Here it is. I want to be where you are in fellowship with you constantly. That's what I believe the psalmist is saying. If I can just take one little phrase to sum up those five verses, 1 through 4 and verse 10. I want to be where you are and fellowship with you constantly. Listen to how he says it. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and a swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Verse 10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. 
So I've summarized that in one phrase. I want to be where you are and fellowship with you constantly. Now, we've already kind of touched on this, but let me go a little deeper. The Old Testament temple was a physical representation of God's dwelling place, especially the holiest of holies. The way, when it was not a temple but a tabernacle, the way they would build it is they would start at the center. It would start at the center. They would uh, put the altar for the holiest of holies. They would wrap it with a tent and then create a room around it that no person was in and would move out from there. Does that make sense? You need, that, that place, as you would take the tent off, would become a holy place, a place that you just couldn't walk in. I mean, no priest would just go, mur, 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 mur. if he walked into the holiest of holies, he was a dead man because that was holy, set apart to God. You don't just trample in the presence of God. And then from there, there were outer courts. There was the court of, of uh, there, there, was, there was the temple court. Then there was the court of the women. There was the court of the Gentiles. And there were limits in places you could go and couldn't go. <clears throat> and, um, but that holiest of holy, the temple itself, you, you just couldn't set things up anywhere. Like in this room, we can set things up anywhere. Because this is not, this is, you are, we're going to get to this, you're the temple. This is a place of worship, but this is not the temple of the Lord. And we've not been given direct guidance for where a pulpit ought to be and a lamp needs to be, but they did. So if somebody moves a lamp, you know, it's not a sin in here. Someone changes seats around, it's not a sin. It's just preferences and and thoughts. But there in the temple, you didn't get to go willy-nilly. There was direction from God because it represented his, the place that his presence would would dwell. And so the Old Testament temple was a physical representation of God's dwelling place. The Shekinah glory filled, glory filled it and never left. It came when Solomon built it and dedicated, not the tabernacle, but the, the, te- the temple itself. In 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 40, how are we doing on time here? Okay, yeah, turn there. 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles yeah, it's back here in the Bible. First, Second Kings, Chronicles. Second Chronicles, six, and verse forty and following. So Solomon has, they've built this temple. Solomon is in the process of dedicating it. And he says this, Now, O oh my God, let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the play, this place of prayer. And now arise, O oh Lord God, and go to your resting place, you and, and the ark of your might. Let your priests, O oh Lord God, be clothed with salvation and let your saints rejoice in your goodness. O oh Lord God, do not return away the face of your anointed one. Remember your steadfast love. For David, your servant. This is Solomon. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. That's how the Shekinah glory presence, uh, the Shekinah uh, glory, the presence of the Lord got in the temple, in his state, and it was there in the holiest of holies. And so the Old Testament temple was a physical representation of God's dwelling place. On the other hand, let me say this, even back in the Old Testament days, the dwelling place of God on earth well, in one sense, it was a building. And the other sense is that a building could not contain him. He contained a building, but a building could not contain him. Matter of fact, Isaiah 6, 3, we learn that, uh, that the, the, pre- the glory of God fills the whole earth. Isaiah 6, 3 says that. Isaiah says that um, your, the glory of God fills, fills the whole earth. So although... God filled a building. His glory was never contained in a building. God's presence and glory fills the whole earth. Now, in the New Testament, the dwelling place of God on earth is where? Believers. 
And once again, we contain the glory of God, the presence of God in the form of the, of the Holy Spirit, yet God's presence is not contained within believers. It fills the whole earth. Just like the temple filled, it was filled with God, but, but could not contain God. The same thing with us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, so turn there and go from Chronicles to Corinthians. Is that confusing to anyone? In uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and that is so not uh, what I'm looking for, 3, 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? My bad, so my notes wrong, but I knew right away that that's not the verse I was looking for. You know what's really funny? When you read it anyway, <laughs> you read the wrong verse. And then you've got two options. You go, I really messed up. Or you just go with it. Try to make it work, right? So, it's 316. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Now go to chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Now you know why I usually cut and paste these things right in my sermon, right? Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So therefore glorify God in your body. So in the Old Testament, the temple was a physical representation of God's dwelling place. In the New Testament, the dwelling place of God on earth is believers. You don't have to make a path to a temple. You can stop right where you are, and you are filled with the presence of God, and you can relate to God in a very real and passionate way. We are always in God's presence, but we are not always engaging God's presence. Does that make sense? What I, I, let me try to explain it a little bit more. Here's, so the New Testament equivalent of this psalm is someone who, who doesn't have to go to get to God because they're filled with the Holy Spirit in a way that Old Testament believers weren't. You always have God, the presence of God. First of all, it fills the whole earth, but also, he's in you, in the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. But for just because we are always in God's presence does not mean that we're always engaging his manifest presence. Have you ever had a time in your life where you felt distanced from God? I'm assuming everyone in this room can give testimony of many times where you just felt distant from God. You just didn't feel his presence. You didn't feel the warmth of his embrace. It seemed like your prayers were just going up. But here's the deal. If you are a believer, he's right here. So there's a difference between God's presence being with you and you engaging his manifest presence. And so um, I want to be where you are in fellowship constantly with you. Um, we see in these first couple verses what fellowship with God creates in the life of a believer who regularly basks in God's manifest presence. He, he mentions some things here about this relationship with God, this connection with, um, with the Lord, what fellowship with God creates. Three things. First of all, look in verse, um, look in verse one. I mean, actually, um, you get to 84. Um, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. First of all, God's transforming presence creates inner beauty and loveliness. When he thought about the place that, that God dwelt, it seemed like a beautiful temple, a lovely place. And it was lovely not because of how it was made, but it was lovely because God was there. You know, I've always said, what makes heaven great? There's probably a million things that make heaven great, but there's one thing that stands above them all. Regardless of what kind of food is there and what kind of things there are to do, what makes heaven so wonderful. And I've always wondered why the scriptures, I think, are relatively silent about heaven. Some people think they're chock full of things. I think